Thanks to Beam for sponsoring this video. Hey, what's up? Peanut butter and jelly has it all basically. It's soft, it's sweet, it's creamy, and somehow allowed to be both lunch and dessert at the same time. Today, I'm gonna show you how to make a rated R version of this sandwich that has tons of interesting textures and flavors and male nudity. I mean, just kidding, but think about that. To get started, I'll need to make a grown-ups version of sliced white bread. For that, I'll grab my stand mixer and in the bowl of that measure 130 grams of warm water, five grams of instant yeast, one large egg, 45 grams of melted but not hot butter, 45 grams of sugar, and 100 grams of roasted and riced rusted potatoes. In general, adding pre-cooked or fully gelatinized potato starch to bread attracts and holds a lot more water than the wheat starches could hold on their own. Plus, the potato starch molecules here make it harder for the wheat starches to retrogradate or stale. So adding potato gets us both more shelf life as well as the unnatural squishy tenderness of commodity sliced white bread. Plus, it tastes really good. Lastly, I'll add in 430 grams of all-purpose flour and then 10 grams of salt. The dough hook goes on and I'll mix this on medium speed for about four minutes or until the dough goes from mashed potatoes and flour into a slightly sticky dough like this. From there, I'll turn this mixer up to high speed and then mix for another seven to eight minutes. I'll mention that all the stuff that makes this bread super squishy and tender, like the butter, potato, and sugar, for example, is also gonna impede the gluten formation. So to mitigate that, I'm gonna mix this dough longer than I would for, say, pizza or bread dough. After 12 minutes of mixing, this dough should be clearing the bowl and more than strong enough to resist tearing when I give it a good firm tug like this. That means the gluten in there is all linked up and it's ready to rip. Next, I'll flip this dough into a medium bowl and then I'll round it off into a nice taut ball so that I can have something more uniform to shape in a little while after the first rise. That looks good. Now I'll cover it with the lid and ferment it here on the counter for two hours. While that rises, let's make the J part of this PB&J. Specifically, I'm talking about jam not jelly. To make it, I'll grab my heaviest bottom pot and into it combine 500 grams or three little clamshells of fresh raspberries. I know the most classic PB&J combo would probably be Concord grape jelly, but fresh Concord grapes are only available where I live like two weeks out of the year. And raspberry is just as lively and bright and fun, but in a different way. Next, I'll add in 75 grams of lemon juice, 75 grams of white distilled vinegar, and then 700 grams of sugar. Yep. That's a lot of sugar, but that's how much it takes to set a jam properly. The ratio of acid, sugar, pectin, and water here is a fixed target, and there's really no way around it. I mean, you could use frozen fruit juice concentrate and extra strength pectin to make a jam, but that's not really low sugar, and those styles of jam tend to be firm and bouncy as opposed to jammy. Now, I'm going to scoot this over to the stove and drop it over high heat. Once it's up to a bare simmer, I'll come back with a wooden spoon and stir it until the acids and raspberries are combined and the sugar is is fully dissolved. Next, I'll cook this fruit until it's fully tender and has released all of its razzy goodness. That's maybe 10 minutes of cooking over high heat. Once it starts to foam up like this though, I'll turn the heat down to medium high so that it doesn't boil over and burn. Then I'll jump in and stir those bubbles down a little bit. After 10 minutes or so, this fruit is just about fully softened and the mixture has had a good chance to reduce. So now I'm gonna do an unnecessary but beneficial step. That's take the pot off heat, grab a strainer, and then scoop about a third to a half of the raspberries in to that strainer. From there, I'll take a wooden spoon and press to get as much of the raspberry pulp and juice pushed through it as possible while leaving behind all of the seeds. But to make sure that the sugar and pectin ratio stay within the sweet spot, I'm gonna stress that you really need to work this to get as much of the pulp and juice pressed through as possible, and then make an effort to come back and scrape that pulp on the bottom of the strainer and make sure that everything of value gets back into the pool. Now the pot goes back on the stove over high heat and I'll keep on cooking. Once this is back up to a rolling boil, I'll add in 60 grams of regular, not low sugar, fruit pectin. I'll whisk that in right away to prevent any clumping, but in my experience, pectin dissolves in any hot liquid pretty easily, so there's no need to mix this up like a cornstarch slurry or anything like that. Once that's stirred in, I'm gonna cook out the water to raise the overall temperature of the sugar, and I'm also gonna take a second to thank Beam for sponsoring this video. To be honest, I've had a lot of trouble falling asleep at night for as long as I can remember. And although I've taken a lot of lifestyle steps to get into a healthier nighttime routine, I still lie there, awake, flopping around to try and find the right sleeping position while usually toiling about my next video. Everything but sleeping, basically. That's where Beam Dream comes in. It's a blend of sleep-promoting ingredients like nano CBD, reishi extract, magnesium, L-theanine, and melatonin, all of which work together in a tasty chocolatey powder to help me feel a little bit more relaxed and ready for sleep. I just blend it with some warm water and drink it about 30 minutes before bed, throw in some blue blockers, and 
catch me snoozing, you guys. Click below and use my code BRIANL to get 35% off your first order when you subscribe, then 20% off all following orders. With a subscription to Dream Powder 2, you never pay for shipping and you get this sick looking beam mug and frother with your first order. You can pause, skip, or cancel your subscription at any time. And this offer is available for both new and existing customers. Again, the link is in my description and use code BRIANL for 35% off your first order. Thank you, Beam. It's been about three to four minutes since I added in my pectin and the jam is looking syrupy and slightly thickened. So now I'm gonna grab my thermometer to see where it's at. The game here is to reduce as much water out of this mixture as it takes to raise the temperature of the syrup to 220F. That's eight degrees hotter than boiling, so it takes quite a bit of reduction. From here, I'm gonna carefully ladle this jam into two pint-sized mason jars. Disclaimer, this is hot syrup and will burn you really bad if it gets on your skin, so pay attention when moving this stuff around and stay Frosty. Once I've got two mason jars lined up like this, I'm gonna pop on some lids and let them cool for three to four hours at room temperature and then another 12 in the fridge so that they can fully set up. But we don't have to wait because I've got yesterday's jam here ready to go. Take a look. Texturally, it's perfectly set, or at least in my opinion, that is an ideal texture for sandwich jam. It's soft and spreadable, but also firm and holds its shape when you need it to. Flavor-wise, it's full of natural fruity brightness from the berries, but also it's got a fresh lemon hit in there and plenty of sweetness to balance out all that acidity. Now, let's check back on the bread. It's been rising for over two hours now, and as you can see, it's over doubled in size and all gassed up. Next, I'm gonna prep a bread proofing vessel, in this case, a one and a half pound loaf pan, and I'll give it a heavy hit of pan spray or neutral oil because this loaf can stick if you don't grease the pan appropriately. Now I'm gonna flip my dough out onto a lightly floured surface, then press to degas aggressively. Once I'm flattened like this, I'll grab the bottom of the dough and fold it up two inches from the top, then I'll grab both sides, pull them out, the right goes over, I'll press that down to seal it, then the left goes all the way over the right, I'll press that to seal. Then I'll grab the top of the dough and fold it in at two to three inches. I'll fold the top corners like this. Now I'll roll the dough back towards myself, pulling back and pressing down to seal in as much tension as I can each time. I'll repeat that five to six times, and once I have the dough sitting on the bottom seam like this, I'm gonna use my fingertips and thumbs to make the dough slightly wider. Now I'll pinch the end shut and then plop this loaf into my sprayed pan seam side down. Now I'm gonna spray this with a little bit of water to keep it from drying out, and then I'll cover it with a towel to proof on the counter for 60 to 90 minutes. While that proofs, let's make the PB part of this PB and J. For that, I'm gonna show you two types of peanut butter made from two different peanuts. On the left here, I've got 500 grams of Spanish peanuts. These are defined by their red papery skins and higher oil content. They're supposed to have the most delicious flavor too out of all of the four major peanut varieties, but we'll see about that. On the right, I have 500 grams of runner style peanuts. This style of peanut is supposed to be a little bit more mellow in terms of flavor, but it'll probably be easier for you to get since most commercially available peanut butters are made from runner peanuts. To get these peanuts into a butterable condition, I'm gonna load both of these trays into a 300F oven to slowly roast them for about 40 to 50 minutes. Yes, higher heat will get you where you're going faster, but the likelihood that you'll over roast these is very high, so I go low. After 45 to 50 minutes in a mellow oven, I'm gonna pull these out. As you can see, they're not really that toasty looking, but for nut butter, you don't really want a deeply roasted nut because it will actually taste kind of burnt once it's milled down. I think that has to do with the friction of the pureeing part that tends to heat up the oil, and if it gets too hot, well, it'll taste kind of like it's burnt and or oxidized. Now to butter these nuts, I'm gonna scoot them one at a time into my food processor. I'll spin them for about 10 to 12 minutes each, but that timing is gonna vary pretty widely based on how powerful Powerful your machine is, but ballpark is like 10 minutes of spinning. The stages are dry and chunky, pasty ball that spins around the center, gritty but getting close, and then finally after about 10 to 12 minutes it'll be well pureed and just starting to get loose like this. This first batch was made with the Spanish variety. As you can see it's a touch darker than traditional peanut butter. It's a little bit looser, mainly because it's warm and the higher oil content. Overall the stuff has a pretty smooth texture, but I'll clarify that it will never be as smooth as Jif. That stuff has mega machines doing all the work and there's a bunch of palm oil and sugar in there to smooth it out. Next I'll do the runner peanuts. Same process as before, 10 minutes of spinning and once it's smooth and just starting to get loose, I'll pop off the lid. As you can see, the runner peanut butter is lighter in color and a touch creamier looking overall. It's also a touch thicker and looks a lot more like Jif than the Spanish butter did. Not saying that's a good thing, but it's noteworthy for sure. Here they are side by side. 
Now I'll give them a taste. The Spanish peanuts have a really nice, deep, intense peanut flavor. Texturally, it's creamy and nice, but I wouldn't call it overly luxurious. The runner nut butter is noticeably creamier and even smoother, texturally amazing, but flavor-wise, kind of lame to be honest. So my choice is the Spanish style. Back to the bread. It's been rising on the counter for about 75 minutes now, and when I poke it, you can see that it just barely holds onto that indent, but gently pushes it back out. Next, I'll spray the outside with a heavy dose of water, then grab my bread scoring lame and rip five to six scores on the top of the loaf on a diag like this. Oh, I snagged it. What a loser. Now, I'm gonna load this into a 400F oven, and lastly, I'll spray the box with a dozen or so squirts of water to create that much more steam, then I'll close up the door and bake for 30 minutes. Time lapse looks sick. And after 30 minutes, I'll pull out the loaf, and yes, that looks great. Almost like a cartoon version of a loaf of bread, actually. This isn't the snagged loaf, by the way. I made two of these just in case I biffed one. Here's the snag donkey. Still looks good, but it's less tall. Now, I'm gonna let this bread cool completely and make the secondary B of this PB&J. That's whipped salted butter. For that, into the bowl of my stand mixer, I'll combine one pound of fully room temperature butter and then a strong pinch of salt, about three to four grams. The whisk attachment goes on and I'll spin this on high speed for three to four minutes. I actually got the whole butter with peanut butter idea from my boy, Ted Wilson at Union Loafers. And trust me when I say that you will never be able to make a PB&J without it again. After five minutes on high speed, this butter is almost white and looks like cake frosting. That's how you know it's good and whipped. So now I'm gonna scoot this into a container and then make my freaking grown up peanut butter and butter and jam sandwich. The first step towards that would be to slice up my potato bread. I let this loaf cool completely because it's so soft that if you didn't, you would mush it into a pile of starch basically. Now I'm gonna cut thick, chunky slices that are about three quarters of an inch. That might seem overly thick, but remember this bread is so light and just so tasty that we're gonna want a lot of it in this sandwich. Once I've got two thickens like this, it's time to assemble. First thing down is two large dollops of Spanish peanut butter. I use the back of a spoon to spread that instead of a knife because this stuff is super sticky and a knife tends to tear up the bread, whereas a spoon is just easier on the whole thing. Once that's evenly spread, I'll go to the second slice and drop a few teaspoons of the whipped butter. Spread that from edge to edge. And next, I'll hit the peanut butter with a liberal dose of crunchy, flaky salt. If you remember, I didn't put any salt in the nut butter when I made it because chunky salt on top is way more dynamic and just way more delicious. Finally, I'll squeeze some raspberry jam on top of the salted nut butter. I put this stuff in a used mayonnaise bottle so that I could drop it on top as opposed to spreading it with a spoon or a knife. This sandwich thrives on contrast and keeping all the flavors and layers separate is crucial to its success. You really want all the mixing to happen inside of your mouth because that's like a thousand times more interesting and delicious. Now the lid goes on and a gentle press to seal it all together. Wow, that is a pretty PB B and J. Like I said, the name of the game here is contrast. All in one bite, you get to experience rich, roasty nut butter. Oh, and then some crunchy salt comes along and amplifies that. Then some unctuous, creamy butter fat. Then cold, sweet, tart raspberries. And now your brain is melted. This is a powerful sandwich, you guys, so beware. We're dealing with the forces of nostalgia here, and this one is gonna hit you pretty freaking deep. I hope you try it soon. Let's eat this thing. Don't forget, if you're someone who struggles with sleep, make sure to check out Beam's Dream Powder in the description to get 35% off your first order.